one of the most common issues, this is an issue that I had when I started training dogs. Actually, you know, before we get there, I see lots of names in blue. If you're watching on TV, which I know a lot of people are according to a, a YouTube and what they tell us from our analytics, um, uh, I see our, moder our moderation crew is uh, sending me messages about my Australian accent. Um, <laughs> um, if you see that people's names are in blue in your chat, if you're watching on TV, open up a phone, open up a tablet so that you can join in the chat. And if you see someone's name in blue, they're part of the McCann Dogs crew and there are trainers. They see Instructor Robbie, Instructor Shannon, I saw Dan Lots of Links Luton, Instructor Aaron, and many more. Now, if their name's in green, they're part of the Heart Dog Supporter Team. And these are people that are uh, part of the Heart Dog Team. They, uh, you know, support the channel with their monthly membership and we get to see their name really easily in the chat as they're asking questions, etc. So one of the big mistakes that I made at the very beginning of my training was not really knowing what expectations I should have from mm -hmm. my puppy, what expectations I should, I should set for my puppy. And one of the things I honestly, one of the very first things that I recognized right away when I came to my very first lesson as a student at McCann Dogs is man, these dogs are capable of so much more than I ever expected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that you need to add to your training plan is uh, outlining your expectations. Number one, what, is, what, what, are the, what are realistic expectations that you can have over a period of time? Number two, I'm going to set some higher expectations than maybe I had initially assumed. Let's talk about expectations for a, let's talk about it for like a brand new puppy and then for like a six or eight, eight month dog, like a dog in that teenage phase mm -hmm. and how expectations can impact your training. Yeah, definitely. I want to say one thing first. I find sometimes that when people are new to puppies or new to dogs or even if they're not new really, is I find that people either, they're on both sides of the scale in terms of their expectation. They either, most commonly, I think people's expectations are too low, just as you said, their their dogs are capable of doing so much better yeah. than what they're doing. But in other circumstances, people have too high of expectations, but they don't realize it. So an example of that is like, taking like a four or five month old puppy for a walk around the block yeah. and yeah. being shocked that their dog is dragging them or doing this or doing that. Well, in those situations, you have very unrealistic expectations because you have a young inexperienced dog who hasn't been trained to do the thing that you've asked. So expectations are really important to understand because you kind of need to know how to alter them based on the age of your dog, or maybe it's the the thing that you're doing with your dog. Mm -hmm. You could have expectations for like teaching your dog tricks or to lie in a bed or something very simple, but then you might need to change them for your dog's reliable recall in the woods or whatever it might be. So I think that's important to keep in mind. Yeah, um, I, I want to add to that. Uh, a lot of people have some expectation uh, that, you know, the dog should just listen or he's done it once. So they expect, oh, the, the dog's trained now. Oh, you know? they know it. They'll, yeah. they'll call them in from uh, the backyard, let's say. And uh, and then the dog doesn't do it the next time because it's only ever worked once. And mm -hmm. they think like, well, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. Really understanding, having appropriate expectations for your dog means you understand that, uh, you know, it is a... It is a moving target. It's, yeah. a, it's a fluid process. And uh, being successful once, it doesn't count as being successful. Mm -hmm. You know, let's talk about uh, the ratio. The ages, yeah. yeah, the ratio. Yeah, so success. why we like to bring this up is sometimes our, our puppies give us a little bit of a false sense of... Um, comfort or security in their listening because it is quite normal for young dogs who don't have a lot of um, worldly experience yet to actually listen fairly well because they don't they don't really know any better at that point they haven't figured out bad habits they're they aren't as curious um, and then we find what happens is people think oh I've hit the jackpot. My puppy's great. You know, he just follows me around or he comes when he's called. He never pulls. This is so awesome. And then that puppy turns, you know, to four months old, five months old, six months old, eight months old, 10 months old. And dogs, just because of age and experience level, really start to change. And unless you're training all the way through along that, adjusting expectations and being realistic about what's happening, you might be very surprised that um, 
dogs start to get worse if right. they don't have the right information. Yeah, they are perishable skills. Yes, yeah. It's it's we always say it's like putting gas in the tank. You don't just yep. fill your car up once and then you can drive forever. You have to maintain your dog's listening skills and you have to, you know, switch up your tactics as your dog hits adolescence or whatever it might be. So it's important to readjust your expectations. Yeah. The the other thing well, that I uh, think is really important for you to understand is that there are all kinds of things in your dog's life that they're gonna find naturally yeah rewarding, self-satisfying. And if your dog is barking at the window and you know you tell them to stop it and they go back and they bark again and you tell them to stop it and they go back and they bark again and you tell them to stop and you're like, well, he's just not getting it. Mm-hmm. The dog doesn't need any more reinforcement than that f- the sensation of like satisfaction when they're barking. It feels good to bark. Mm-hmm. And in an absence of good information, whatever feels good, they're going to think that's right. Mm-hmm. So you need to be to be planning ahead a little bit more with a lot of these nuisance behaviors. I know a lot of people struggle with accidents in the house, uh, chewing on stuff, uh, barking mm-hmm. it, wherever it is. Uh, and you need to really have a plan in place for working through these uh, mm-hmm. types of situations. Shandy Blake. She, is, she needs a chat. big toot. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Hi, Shan. Faces. Thank you for the super chat, Shandy. Changing the lights. Um, Going green. So understanding, you know, why why your dog is doing doing what they're doing, having the right expectations, knowing that if they're doing something wrong, guess what? It's your fault. Mm-hmm. It's your fault that they're making this mistake because you're not giving them the right information Shush. at the right time. What else do you want to do here? What? I saw you. You're, what's, what's up? Nothing. I was just telling my puppy to be quiet. Oh, should, should we? Did you hear re- him? Release the hounds. He is. He is making the tiniest little because he wants to be yeah, wants out to here with us. But he's out. going to learn to just chill out in that grate behind us. The other thing that I think is really important is a lot of people. And this is so common, guys. If you're making this mistake, I want you to rethink, reevaluate your training plan. They'll say something like, "Oh, it's a, and I made this mistake." So. Listen, I get it. Oh, it's a lab. Uh, you know, they're going to jump up until they're like two, two and a half. They're going to, you know, they're going <laughs> to pull it on leash. magically goes away. Yeah. You know, it's a sled dog. They're going to pull until they're like four or whatever. They're going to pull forever. Not the case. <laughs> Absolutely. Unequivocally, not the case. It's all about great information. So understanding that you're, they don't know anything, but also understanding that you can teach them nearly anything mm-hmm. is going to be a really important step. In, your, in putting together a realistic but, you know, uh, successful dog training plan or puppy training plan, regardless of the age. Yeah, absolutely. Next important thing that most people are missing in their training plan is good leadership. Mm-hmm. Now, this one covers so many different challenges, as well as, like, things like resource guarding can, uh, you know, come up. And, I mean, there's a difference between, like, resource guarding, dangerous resource guarding, and, like, behavior that feels like resource guarding. We've seen a few students lately that like ran into some issues because they just didn't have a good leadership plan in place. Let's talk a little bit about like puppy leadership, what it means. Um, I don't know what direction you're trying to set me up for right now. Let's talk about leadership. What does it mean? Okay. He's letting me go rogue is what's what's happening here. Um, So leadership is a hard thing. And I think that a lot of people think to themselves, well, of course I'm my dog's leader. Um, but the matter of the fact is, when, when most people start out with their training, um, your puppy doesn't automatically just view you as their leader. They're used to coming, you know, from a litter and they probably viewed their mom as a as a leader. And then they had their brothers and sisters and they just sort of were one of the pack. And then they get taken from that scenario, dropped in your household. And then they kind of have to figure out, okay, who here do I need to listen to? Um, so it can be it can be a little bit challenging. Um, leadership also, if you read or educate yourself about it all over the internet, it can mean so many different things. And I think sometimes when people hear the word leadership, they associate it with you having to be like this like strict drill sergeant type of, of thing. And, and that's no, not really what we're getting at uh, either. To us, leadership is somebody who gives really good clear, consistent information. They're really fair with their expectations. They know when to, you know, 
redirect the dog or correct the dog for something that's not right, but they also understand how to show the dog how to be right, how to set the dog up to be right so that it builds the dog's confidence in themselves and also in you as a leader. A good leader also knows how to have good follow through so they don't end up repeating themselves and sound like a broken record so, so that the dog learns that your words don't matter. Um, a good leader understands how to put dogs in situations where they're not going to be overfaced or overwhelmed so that you're not putting them into you know a scenario where they're going to get scared or they're going to get jumped on by another dog or they're going to make a poor choice so this is really like the big thing about leadership and um the more you know about dog training the more naturally you will establish better leadership with your dog and i think sometimes people think equate leadership to like nipping and biting or like the dog's overall behavior just put him in in here and it'll be it'll be fine um they equate it to like the overall leadership is like the the dogs like um, nipping and biting and things like that. But really, um, it, it's it's about everything. It's about all of the dog's behavior. And what a lot of people don't realize is the more you train your dog to be um, obedient and to listen, the better they be better their behavioral issues become. The less they bark inappropriately, the, the nipping and biting goes away, the chewing and stuff goes away um, very naturally because the dog starts to view you in a different light because of the obedience training. And that's why we encourage people to start their training so early because it completely changes uh, your relationship with the dog and helps you to kind of get through some of those really icky parts of having a puppy. Puppies are cute and snuggly and adorable, but they're also a big pain in the butt sometimes and stressful. Um, so the training can make a big, a big difference. So that's really the did you talk about like the some of the uh, tools that you might use like what what are great management tools to I did you, not talk about to that. put you in a good position to be a leader because it seems a little abstract mm -hmm. you know when you're thinking about these high level ideas but when you understand how the what tools to use and how to set your dog up so that mm -hmm. you appear as a great leader it makes life so much easier yeah so I talked about being consistent. I talked about having good timing, giving your dog good information. And as Ken said, you need to have some good management tools in place in order to actually execute all of those things. Um, we are big believers in crate training while you're training a young dog because um, it gives them a, a place where they can go, where they're safe, where they're comfortable. And also they're not repeating poor behaviors. You know, we as Humans are very busy. We have lots of things on the go, and yeah. there's re it's really quite impossible, even if you work from home. Um, you know, I work from home a couple days a week, and I sometimes feel like I'm busier when I'm here than I am at work. When it would be home. impossible um, to to watch the dog all of the time. So it's important that you utilize things like a crate. Um, we have endless videos on crate training. If your dog's not super comfortable with a crate quite yet, it's very, something you can work through very easily. Um, you could also um, use like baby gates or barricades to um, confine the dog to a smaller space to help them stay closer to you. We often suggest putting um, a house line or a leash on your dog inside the house this really throws people they think leashes is, are for taking dogs for a walk which they are um but they can also be helpful to utilize in the house so if my puppy or my dog grabs something they're not supposed to or steals something or is chewing on something and i walk over to stop them they can't just run away and avoid getting in trouble for that i can right. take a hold of the leash and then i can redirect them appropriately i don't have to lose my cool i don't have to chase them around which completely lowers my status as leader i can just handle it calmly and with a lot of control which sends such a great message to the dog and means you get to power through some of those things a lot faster because your management skills are so on point yeah and i think a big part of that when we're talking about adding a leadership plan or having leadership strategies in your training plan comes down to knowing that you're there's going to be mistakes you're going to make mistakes but what do you do when those mistakes are made let's say you're you know have family coming over and your dog's likely not going to be super well behaved the first time they meet your excited sister or whatever like your family member that you know loves puppies it's going to be really tough so what are you going to do as a great leader for that for your dog you're going to uh, have a training plan maybe you're going to manage the puppy or the young dog in training and, and they're going to be in their crater in another area where they can't make mistakes they can't jump up on family members maybe you're going to have a leash or a line on the dog when you're outside all the time if you aren't absolutely sure that your dog's going to respond to their name or if you aren't absolutely sure that your dog's going to leave something alone that you're worried about then you're going to have 
things in place, these leashes, mm -hmm. these lines. That's what a great leader does. A great leader also understands how to get more out of their dog. You know, they understand that, oh, you know what? When we're doing recalls, I bring out this fuzzy tug toy and my dog goes totally bonkers. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that in this situation, when we're walking in a busier environment, I need to bring the good treats I, yeah. or whatever. I need to use my voice more. A great leader is good at those things because they've worked with their dog just enough to know that these tweaks in their training make a massive difference. I also think in line with leadership is is relationship. And one of the things that we're sort of saying in a very roundabout way is the more you do stuff with your dog, the stronger your relationship gets. Right. And then what happens is your dog's view of you, puppy, dog, doesn't matter the age, it starts to be more about how they can please you or they want to spend time with you. They choose to, you know, lay near you and not just go and do their own thing. They, you know, when we let our dogs out, you know, to go play, they don't even play with each other. They all run around and they turn around and they stare at me and they're like, mom, what are we yeah, doing? Yeah. Because we've just established such a rapport and that is through all of the time that we spent while they're young doing training and managing. I don't give my dogs of puppies a lot of time to just go off and make up their own agenda because when you have a puppy, their agenda is going to be filled with things that we typically don't want them to do. So by having good management, I'm basically showing my dog how to make great decisions throughout the day and then I can start to trust them which means I don't have to use my crate so much anymore I don't have to use my leash quite so much anymore so it's important that you follow that but the more you train the the better your relationship becomes and then all of this stuff starts to follow suit this is a really important point I like that Margaret uh, asked she said when you say high value treats what are you referring to and this is a really important point. And I know uh, it's so often on YouTube, people are like, well, what do I do when this? What is my? What do I do for dog training in this situation? This is uh, no different, it depends. So some dogs, maybe they love meat. Maybe it's like uh, hot dogs or cut up pieces of steak. Maybe it's some leftover chicken uh, that you've cut up into small pieces. Maybe it's cheese. Maybe it's kibble. I mean, it just depends entirely maybe on your like dog. Carrots. It could be carrots. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah we get some interesting uh, yeah. uh, rewards from our My students. My dog personally doesn't care about carrots. Yeah. But I know some people that swear by it. It's just like yeah. people. You know, we don't all like the same thing. Right. And Except the way for you grilled cheese. We all like grilled cheese. <laughs> Uh, the goal here is to try to find, to practice, try different types of things and then watch how your dog reacts. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times that, you know, a student has come into class and they, you're using some type of treat and the dog is so disconnected, they don't really care and I'll pull out chicken meters or some of our tuna treats or something. And it's literally like it's a different dog. They're like looking and staring and they just want to do whatever they need to do to get that treat. Now you have a completely different participant ready and willing to learn. So um, it's important important that you use what what is going to work for your dog and really the only way to find that out is you know go with some suggestions and try a few different things but watch your dog's behavior do you get more eye contact do they seem a little bit more excited do are they engaged a little bit longer um you, you know it's fairly easy to tell when the dog's into something and when the dog's kind of like meh not really too sure about that so um you got to try different stuff because every dog is different this is where some people will say, well, I don't want to use food in my training. I don't want to be dependent on food. And um, that's honestly, when I first came to McCann Dogs 16 years ago or however long it was, I remember thinking, ooh, food, food might not work. I don't know if I'm comfortable using food. And what I discovered very quickly is that f food is a valuable tool in your training. No different than toys and play, no different than uh, praise or motion I've discovered, but um, it's it's very specific and it's such a valuable tool for um, that a lot of dogs naturally find rewarding. Like you don't have to mm -hmm. build drive for food. It's, it's, you know, it's a resource that dogs really want. McCann Dogs was actually founded uh, on the idea that you should use food in training at a time when that was yeah, not a 40 good. 40 years ago. That was not, a, yeah. People, people didn't agree to this. It no. was a, they thought it was a bad idea. You shouldn't, they're called, uh, your mom and dad, Kale's mom and dad who founded McCann Dogs 40 years ago, were called cookie trainers because people thought, well, you know, you shouldn't be using food. You just use like a sharp correction and that will, you know, give the dog enough information. Yeah, but what they started noticing by changing the way they were motivating the dogs is the dogs were doing all of the same things as the other dogs, but they looked happier, their right. tails were up, their ears were up, yeah. they were more willing to do the work. And then, you know, we learned through 
founding the McCann method of training, how to start with food and then transition and proof so that the food, rather than becoming a lure or a bribe, then becomes a reward, then becomes a random reward, and then eventually you don't need it and you can just use the word yes or praise or random rewards whenever you feel like it. So it is important, you know, for dog training that you do understand that you you don't become dependent on something. The only way you become dependent on something is if you're not using it correctly. There's a, a certain formula that we follow yeah. that allows all of the dogs to work through these processes um, and not have a problem yeah. transitioning away from food when the time is right. Absolutely. Um, the next thing that you need to add, and honestly, this is, it's funny because uh, we'll do this like today. We'll do this with our trained dogs as well because it's a great refresher. But we need to talk about some impulse control exercises. And I actually pulled a clip from a video that talked about nipping and biting from years, a few years ago. Uh, actually, several years ago now. But I thought it was a great example. And I wanted to show you exactly how to do some of these, uh, you decide, we call them exercises. Rule outs. They're, they're called yeah, rule outs. They're, they're, they're rule outs, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a great way to teach your dog to earn the food. I, I love the saying, we, we talk about this often, but the idea that food comes through you rather than from you. When you can uh, recognize what, what the difference is, all of a sudden it, it unlocks your training. When you understand that your dog is working a little bit, putting in some effort, maybe they're sitting a little bit faster, maybe they're like giving you a little bit more attention. And because of that, you're rewarding them rather than you just being a walking pocket of treats. Yep. There's a difference. So let's talk a little, uh, let's, I'm gonna show you guys this uh, little clip that is all about some of these rule out activities. And I want you to do this, honestly, if you're sitting on the couch, your dog is nearby, this is a great exercise to work on in, over the next five minutes, but check this out. The next thing I'm gonna show you is an exercise that we call You Decide. And we basically put all of the um, responsibility on the dog. Mm -hmm. And what I'm gonna do is teach him to have a bit of self-control so we can see that he really likes this food. Mm -hmm. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and see if I can teach him to leave the food alone in order for me to reward him. So if I, I'm just gonna use one piece of food here. Rem, what's this? Can you sit for a sec? Good, so I'm gonna hold it open. And if he goes for it, I'm gonna close it. Yes, good boy. Now that was... So that moment, did you see that moment? Kale wasn't necessarily looking for the dog to do anything other than not stuff his nose mm -hmm. into her, in the palm of her hand. Go ahead. Yeah, and it's important that when you do this that you need to be very quick. You can see how fast my yes command came out and then Remy's head snapped back because he was like, hey, he, he didn't even realize what he did to right. earn a reward and you will see in the next moment how Remy starts to put two and two together. But if I had said nothing there and he had looked away and then he'd look back, I, I would have just had to keep repeating the wrong thing. So what I'm looking for for this in this exercise is any moment where the puppy shows, okay, I'm gonna pull myself away from this food so that I can then say, okay, now you can have the food. So this is reinforcing self-impulse control. It's an accidental reward because he happened to see a distraction at the same time, <laughs> but I'm gonna roll with it. Okay, so I'm gonna show him the food. I'm gonna open my hand. Yes, good. Oh, and when he makes the decision. Yes, good. Oh, wow. To not go for it. Yes, oh, my God, you're so smart. Good. Yes. Oh, so see how he's learning that when I go for it, it disappears. So I'm going to pull it away. Pull it away. Yes. Good boy. So do you see how when he tries to go towards it, now he, all he's doing is leaning his head in, but I'm not even accepting that. I'm basically I'm going to show it to him again. No, he tries to go for it. I'm going to pull it away. Pull it away until he... Yes, excellent. <laughs> he shows a little bit more self-control. So again, this is putting me in charge, but I'm basically just playing a dorky little game with him mm -hmm. where basically I'm saying, here's a distraction, but how do you get it? Mm -hmm. You get it by showing me self-control and then I'm gonna give it to you from there. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? It's really easy, but it's a lot harder than you think. Oh yes. <laughs> and one of the things that's so challenging about it, Remy Room, yeah. So I love that demonstration because, yeah, you know, he, you picked up see, on it so fast. he did pick up on it really quickly. It also spoke a little bit to the idea of expectations. So, mm -hmm. you know, you we, you had low expectations at the beginning. So you had to work really, Kale had to work really hard and you'll have to work really mm -hmm. hard, not allowing your dog to get the food. But if you're consistent and you don't, you know, inadvertently uh, f accidentally feed your dog at the wrong time, just be consistent with it your dog starts to get it. Then Kale raised her expectations a little bit. She had Remy 
wait a moment longer. Mm -hmm. She's slowly building on these little wins. Every single little win, the next one, just a little bit more and just a little bit more. And this is how you go from a dog who, you know, is diving in your pocket or is jumping up every time he hears the, the cheese string container come out to a dog that like sits, you know, obediently and waits for you to get what's so funny. I just don't know if people put cheese strings in a container. I, I don't know. Like yeah, I weird, just, but... I was think I couldn't think of what the thing is that cheese strings are in, but I do love cheese strings and so do the dogs. <laughs> um, another thing that's hard to, to understand is you look at that exercise and you think, okay, well, that's great. But like, it maybe I don't know whether that looks easy or whether that looks challenging yeah, wait, to you. Let's find out. So how did, is that something that you can do at home right now during the train station? Is this something that you can do before you go to bed tonight? Let us know. Because this exercise is that important that I think you should be working on it tonight. If you have a dog in training, which I assume you do uh, because you're watching this train station mm -hmm. episode, is this something that, that seems accessible to you or, or is so. something that you, that you can or will do with your training? Yeah, and this can be done with any age of puppy. I think somebody was saying, can I do this with my 14-week-old puppy? You can do this with a 10-week-old puppy. Yep, you can do it with any age of dog. It doesn't matter. Um, and um, somebody else had asked, uh, how do you teach yes? Do you just start by being a treat dispenser? Yes and no, Melissa. You're going to do word associations. You're going to say yes, and then one second later, since that's the learning time frame of a dog, you're going to reward right after the word yes. So it's not yes and feed at the same time. It's yes, then feed. Yes, then feed. So what happens is when the dog hears the word yes, they anticipate the food coming, which adds a lot of a, a, a great positive spin on the word yes. What I wanted to say about that exercise, though, when I was asking about whether you thought it looked easy or hard, is what a lot of people don't realize is that that particular exercise is a foundational step that is going to bridge the gap between leaving food to not going out the front door if it's open, to right. not jumping yeah. up on somebody as you approach. So basically what we're doing by that exercise is we're, we're laying a foundation, teaching the dog just the premise of having self-control in a really easy game that allows the dog to have success. And then you're going to take the same theory of you can't go unless you give me this first type of thing in all kinds of different scenarios that your dog requires more self-control and just greeting and people coming to the door and you know that type of thing just comes to top of mind um but it's all sort of the same thing so i think sometimes people get confused by that they look at an exercise like that and they think well great how's that going to help me it's it's not that exercise that's going to help you it's what the dog's learning yeah. from that exercise yeah. well, that's a good point and it's yeah. what the dog's understanding about you in that exercise. They're learning to be respectful of you. They're learning to be patient around you. They're learning to um, want to do, to, think. to problem solve yeah. for you. Yeah. I think you heard me say to, to the, um, the student in the video there, this is a non-confrontational way that I'm establishing myself as the person in charge right now, but we're doing it in a really fun, gentle game that sets the record straight, but the puppy says, I think you're pretty cool, lady. This is a pretty fun thing. And that helps me for all, all of my other exercises. Listen, dog training can be challenging. It can feel overwhelming. It can feel like, oh, man, I don't know if I'm doing anything right. But this is exactly what we just taught you, that exercise. It is so simple. The dog has to wait for you to feed it. That's it. You can open your hand, you close it again. If the dog's really struggling, you take your hand a little further away. But it's so easy and there's mm. you know, there's not a lot of moving parts. So these are the kinds of things that you want to do with your uh, eight-week-old puppy mm. to your eight-year-old uh, whatever, uh, you know, Vigila, who is absolutely bonkers about their kibble. Mm -hmm. You know, the, these exercises are so important. And I, uh, I, we got a super chat, which we're going to mention in just a second. But Melissa says, where do you start pairing it with other commands? Well, it, when it, in, in this instance, we're not. The mm -hmm. dog needs to know that they leave that thing alone. This is why this exercise works because it's yeah. not command you do something. It's they 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 choose. You decide and choose. yourself. Yeah. It's it's a it's a self control game. Yeah. You know, if I if we are having dinner or if I have something in my hand and I drop it on the floor, that doesn't mean my dog gets to grab it. If I was to say, get it or okay, that might be okay. But I want my dog to see there's a distraction in front of me. I'm going to wait for further instruction. My in, my impulse isn't going to be to grab that thing or to go to that thing. My impulse is going to be look at my owner and then, then decide what I do. Do I back off? Do I 
it, will she give me permission to get it? What will it be? That's what this is teaching. So for this exercise, you're actually not saying leave it. You're not you're not saying anything. You're letting your dog do all of the problem solving on their own. There's no command involved except for the word yes or praise or to tell them how wonderful they are. I, mean, I just want to say, Mark said this exercise is also great to teach them not to charge their food bowl. Uh, I believe Mark's one I of our students. That. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's a great uh, a great way to transfer this exercise over for sure. That's awesome. Um, I like that. And this is what our the, the, the methodology, the McCann method is all about, like building motivation. The dog, we're get, setting up great choices, and then we're rewarding the dog for the good choices. They Teaching make a them mistake. to want to do the thing. Absolutely. Uh, for those of you who are puppy owners, our Puppy Essentials program, let's talk a little bit about, very quickly, what they could be working on with you. You know, a lot of people are, are thinking to themselves like, well, geez, I just don't know. What do I start with? Like, mm -hmm. where do I begin this yeah. process? Yeah. We work a lot on a lot of the basics in Puppy Essentials, of course, um, all, all the things that you would expect to work on. But the things that we've added into the course is also things like we're kind of talking about tonight, how to build um, leadership with your puppy, how to stop nipping and biting, um, how to build a strong relationship so your dog actually wants to work for you, how to build their confidence around new places, new things, so that they're a well-rounded, wonderful family member for you. Um, and then in addition to that, you know, sometimes we have in-person classes. You can come and work with us directly at our school. We're here in um, Flamborough, Ontario. Um, if you're not local, which I would imagine many of the people on this um, on this call are, um, is we have our online classes. And sometimes people are a little bit apprehensive to take an online class because they think they're going to kind of be left to work on their own devices. But Which is the case in, in, a, lot in, of, in a lot of online courses. Yeah. But, um, you know, you know, we've worked really hard to develop our program so that you are really, really and truly supported by our, our McCann staff. Ken and I are just two faces um, amongst a, a very, really a large and experienced team that, yeah. that will be able to help you. Um, we actually do weekly um, uh, coaching calls every single week where we do deep dives. There's so much opportunity for uh, for support so that in 24 hours a day. So if you're in a totally different country than us, yeah. um, you know, we can still assist you so it, it really is um quite a, an excellent um program and um it just makes sure that you get started on the right foot so that you're not getting several months down the road and then having to backtrack and retrain things yeah and uh lots of links and instructor Aaron, i think dropped the links to our programs if you have a dog that's over uh five months over four months then life skills is a program for you mm -hmm. heather McMaster. we offer the same things in, in life skills just different skills <laughs> dropping the super chat Thank you for that, Heather. She says, hi, we live in a condo complex, so it's, uh, it is necessary to use a leash to get to our pet area and a three and a half month old with our three and a half month old puppy. She does pretty well on a loose leash, but I'm worried because uh, are we to wait on leash? Uh, I'm wondering if she means like pulling, the dog's pulling. Yeah. Um, yes, it's hard when you have a puppy. Um, to not rehearse a lot of pulling on the leash. So um, I would recommend, Heather, I don't know what breed of puppy you have, but uh, with three and a half months old, you might be able to carry your puppy a little bit so that you can avoid the pulling. There's a couple of things you could do. You could try carrying the puppy. You could also try luring the puppy with a little bit of food to help prevent the pulling. You could use um, a longer leash to give the dog a little bit more freedom, provided that the scenario that you're in is a safe one. Um, you could make sure that whatever collar that you intend to train and walk your dog on in the future is not one that you're using in this early stage of of training so that your puppy is not rehearsing poor behavior on a, further equipment a specific example we don't use uh, harnesses in our training with leash walking it's not a great tool it doesn't give the dog good information so uh we've learned over time that collar a simple flat buckle collar is the best uh, thing to use but in a situation like this, you know, when we're taking a puppy out to pee, maybe a harness is the yeah. right thing because we don't care if the puppy pulls on it. You know, yeah. it, it's not giving them great information anyway. Why not just let them pull a little bit? With that said, though, mm -hmm. you know, I love Kale's example of luring, uh, using food to walk your puppy out to that location. And it talks a little bit about one of the important points that we need to talk about tonight that you need to add your dog training plan is being proactive for setting up success. Mm -hmm. So every time, you know, when we have a puppy in the house or any dog in training, you know, we've had uh, adult dogs that came into our house as well. We have like 
treats readily available. There are things available to reward that dog. And in the case of a puppy, we have treats, we'll be washing our clothes and there's like treats in in all of the pockets. You know, there's little like piles of treats that might be. Not unless you're using a bait bag. They're That's theory. true. Which we just got our new order bait bag. So you guys can check it out. <laughs> McCann Dogs, that's where they're pretty awesome. But, um, you know, you're, you're uh, in, in your case, uh, uh, Heather, you're going to be proactive and you're going to know that, okay, I'm going to have to take the puppy out for a pee after I take her, uh, take her out of the crate, if you know, whatever. Take, take my, yeah, her, her out of the crate. Um, so I'm going to get some treats too. And I know when we get out there, she's going to do her business and then maybe we can work on like some response to name in this new environment. I've got my treats ready. So being proactive and setting up success is so valuable that I want you to think about every time your puppy's out, every single time your puppy is out doing something, especially when it's something new or something that they're struggling with, I want you to reassess in your brain, how can I set this up so that the dog can be successful? Um, Heather's just saying there, she has a German Shepherd Border Collie mix, but I thought we had to wait on using the leash. Um, no, Heather, you don't have to wait on using the leash. What we suggest, maybe where you're getting mixed up, is we suggest waiting on walking your puppy. Yeah. Having your dog on a leash and walking your puppy are two totally different things. Yeah. Um, we actually want the puppy to be on leash right from the get-go, so you always have control. And we spend a lot of time teaching them how to walk on a loose leash uh, all of the time before we actually go out and do the walk so our dogs have some training. So that might provide a yeah, little bit more clarity yeah. for you. I, Knock it sounds off. Like it. That is enough. Everybody wants to party here in the train station. They can hear that. It must be the 805 rolling in. <laughs> um, so Kia, drop in the super chat. Thank you for the super chat, Kia. <laughs> Kia says... Uh, after just three months in your life skills course, yay, instructor Shannon and Robbie, mm -hmm. uh, we just took our seven-month-old Shih Tzu on vacation with amazing success. Oh, we made our trip. This is cool. why we do this. This it is why is. We, it's very, very cool. We want you to do stuff with your dogs. They are not meant to like hang on the backyard and like never get to go anywhere with you. You should have a dog to be part of your family. And the more they're well trained they are, the more you feel like you want to take them places and enjoy them. So that is so cool, Kia. To Robert, uh, to, to Albert's point, uh, as a graduate of both programs, I can tell you it's absolutely worth it. Uh, the more you put into the program, the more you will get from it. it gives you freedom. Uh, to go at your own pace. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. something we really Thank like Thank you, Albert. About. That's awesome. So talking about being proactive. So uh, a, a, an example of this was a uh, beeline. Like when we're walking her on the yeah. street. Um, you may have seen some videos where we sh uh, show beeline. We took her down into uh, some busy environments down from uh, our training hall in the city of Burlington, which maybe you live there. I don't know. Or, or nearby. Maybe you know where it is. But it's a busy environment from what she's used to. So what are some proactive steps that we took to make sure that that experience went as well as possible. Yeah, well, number one, we made sure we were armed with her favorite training treats, that's for sure. She also loves toys, she loves to tug and play. Yeah. So we took that with us as well. Um, and the other thing that I did with her that's a little bit unconventional is um, I used a gentle leader, it's a specific head halter. And I did that because I really wanted to make sure that when we went down there, um, she wasn't doing a lot of pulling and I didn't really want in that moment to have to address her for pulling she was quite young she her walking training wasn't really completely done yet um and so the gentle <coughs> leader was just had a nice calming effect on her it helped her relax it gave her more confidence and for when we went down there the first part of the um of the experience was not walking up to every person that we saw and kind of forcing her to go say hi it was just being around the people. It was just sitting on a bench and rewarding her as people walked by. And every time she would look at somebody, I would reward her. And she started to go, okay, this is pretty cool. And then we sort of saw that she was getting more comfortable and worked up to actually letting her greet people. But we went there with not the intention of like going for a walk ourselves and doing our thing. We were there with the intention of building her confidence and making sure we were putting her, her in situations where that was more likely to happen. We were armed with the proper training equipment. Um, you know, we were reading her body language. We were trying to make the best decisions possible to make sure that we were helping her confidence and not hurting her confidence. We had a short and sweet trip. So all of those things went into um, allowing her to, to have some comfort in that scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but we planned ahead. A recall is a great example. Mm -hmm. You know, people will get their dogs out in a situation without a long line on, which I highly suggest that you have for your dog as you're working on some exercises and in introducing them to new environments. But they'll get out there and uh, just hope the dog comes back. You know, so many people, guys, avoid the dog park, but, you know, so many people go out to these safer environment and the dog just runs and 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 then you call 
and they don't come back. And they're well, like, what does your dog just learn? I'm not coming. Yeah, absolutely. It's way more fun if I run around like a maniac than respond to you. But if you had set it up and you'd worked on a couple of short response to names before your dog got into that frame of mind or that far away, or you had some way to stop them from running and running and running, you had your long line on, it's going to make a massive difference in your training. Um, Deborah, let's see here. Uh, Deborah Ogan, thank you for the super chat. We'll keep her eyes peeled for a question. Um, let's talk about the difference. Oh, I see. I don't know whether that's her question, but uh, she's right there. Yeah, okay. Let's see right here. Oopsie daisy. Stand by. Where'd she go? There. Oh, there's. He caught on quick with the rule of the food, but as soon as the treats are gone, he continually jumps on me. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about uh, working on some of the management techniques to be a great leader in this situation. Yeah, so... Um, there's a couple things to think about. This is another one of those situations where you can continue with your rule out. So the same way when I offer the food, if my puppy is deciding to leave the food alone, uh, or sorry, go after the food, I'm gonna pull the food away. If my puppy is starting to jump on me, I'm also gonna pull the food away. The difference here though is that jumping is also a very self-rewarding uh, behavior for your puppy. So you could try pulling your hand away and just you know, ignoring the dog for a second. And if they start to go, well, that's not working and they, you know, sit back down. Yes, then I can reward that. Um, if, however, the dog finds just too much natural enjoyment and they're jumping and jumping and jumping and not putting together that the sitting on the floor is what's earning the reward, then I would highly recommend, I would rec rec recommend this regardless. When you do this, to have your dog on some type of leash or, or line of some sort and even just pop it on the floor and step on it with your foot so that they can't actually jump up. Um, you might even just take them by the collar and place them back into a sit and just very calmly tell them settle and then go back to your exercise um, again. But what I would not allow the dog to do is just continue rehearsing the jumping. I would break that off. I would stop it uh, using the leash, whatever it might be, so that that wasn't something that could continue with the puppy. Um, but just keep in mind, your timing's really important. If your puppy's jumping and jumping and jumping, and there's no information being given to the puppy, um, they're going to keep doing it because it's yeah. lots of fun. So make sure you have good timing with your yes and your reward uh, when that, that pup's all four on the floor and not airborne. <laughs> MC21M, thank you for the super chat. Uh, tips for separation anxiety. Pup sleeps two uh, plus hours in the crate in the other room alone, no problem. When we try to leave the house, he hears us and he starts crying. So many people uh, uh, really are looking for a thing like can I do this thing can I give them this thing that's going to make them that's going to satisfy them in in the situation relax them in this situation and the reality is it's going to take a little bit of work so let's talk about a couple of steps that they can do before leaving the house that are going to put the dog in a better mind frame uh, uh, for when they leave because obviously the dog's comfortable in his crate but it's that leaving it's it's it, let's talk about that let's, let's break that down yep um First of all, I would I would work up so pup sleeps um, two plus hours uh, in a crate in the other room alone, no problem. Um, you know, I don't know the age of your puppy, but uh, two hours is really not that long of a time. So I would probably work on increasing that time when you're home to begin with that will probably help um, and second thing too is you need to work through it slowly so um, you know maybe you need to switch up your routine of how you're leaving so that your puppy doesn't necessarily start okay she grabbed her key she grabbed her coat now she's now she's heading out I know exactly what's happening yeah. um, you know put the puppy in the crate 15 20 minutes before you leave put them in their crate with a Kong or uh, a stuffed Kong or a, a, a great chew bone something that keeps them occupied maybe Maybe throw on some music for your dog to kind of, you know, not make it so obvious that you're leaving and then slip out. Don't make it a big deal. Be careful that you're not leaving and going, it's okay, pup. It's okay, pup. Yeah. I'll see you soon because that just milks the, the attitude from the puppy. You just want to be very neutral and, and um, you know, you need to practice leaving the house for, you know, 15, 5, 10, 15 seconds at a time and then walking back in the house and praising your puppy. I wouldn't reward your puppy. I wouldn't give any physical rewards because you don't want the puppy to learn to just long, longingly wait until you return. Right. Um, but, you know, you know, I would leave for a few minutes and and a few seconds maybe at, 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 at a time. And if you walk outside the door and you hear nothing, Walk back in. Good puppy. That's so good. Good quiet. You know, allow the puppy to learn that when they're quiet and settled, 
you're you're going to come back in and appear. But if you're leaving for long periods of time and there's not a lot of information that's happening, it can be hard for the puppy to understand. So um, yeah, a couple yeah. a couple things that um, I, I think are important are uh, before you leave, spend a little bit of time exercising, making sure your puppy's you know Tired. burnt bur- yeah burned off all that energy, had their peas and their poops, and they don't need anything when you put them into their crate. Another neat trick uh, we were talking instructor carol but um she would the dog was ready the 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 family was ready to leave they she they put a kong specifically with peanut butter in it because this dog absolutely loved peanut butter they put it uh she put it in the crate and but didn't allow the dog access to it so they were Mm. really excited but they were like milling around they were excited uh the dog was excited to get in there and then uh as the family was ready to leave you let the dog in and they're just so excited and like uh satisfied by getting to the kong they're not even thinking about where you're going Mm -hmm. by the time you're gone it's just like you're you've already gone and the same thing as when you're hanging around in the house they just it's you're triggering it's likely a trigger of some kind that your dog's like "Uh uh-oh things are changing they're getting ready to leave so you have to avoid that. Mm-hmm. The other thing Kel mentioned briefly, using music. Check out the McCann Dogs music channel. We actually worked with some digital uh, composers to make music that's specifically for dogs, for mm-hmm. your dog to relax to. We play it all the time. It's it, we, awesome. Yeah, we play it all the time. We play it in our crate room. We play it like when we're traveling. I put speakers in Bee's crate when I have to fly her to Netherlands. Oh, And then mm, uh, it could lull her into a relaxed yeah, state. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, I don't think maybe, it's possible, but maybe I would really though. like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but check it out. It's actually a uh, one of our channels. Also, you can listen to it on Spotify um, or uh, Apple Music. Talking about uh, the difference between one of the steps I want you to, to, to understand and add to your training plan is know the difference, do your research. We talk a little bit about it here on this channel between preparing, proofing, and practice. The three mm-hmm. steps of your training, knowing how to work your way through any exercise. So when we talk about prepare, it's kind of like the foundation of you know, you're making the environment the way you want it. You've got your uh, treats and your rewards and everything ready. Your dog's now on a line. And let's say we're going to work on a sit in a busy environment. The prepare stages is just you being ready, You dog having your dog on a line. You've, you've, you know what your strategy is going to be. It's going to be that uh, uh, sit command, then lure the dog into sit and reward him in position. But that only goes so far. And you're like, okay, well, what's next? So let's talk a little bit about proofing and practice and what the difference is between proofing and practice that might apply to this dog that's sitting in a busy environment. Because it's going to be really helpful for transitioning you from the foundation steps all the way to like skilled steps. Mm -hmm. So when we're proofing an exercise, the idea of proofing is to be practicing in a environment that is controlled and allows us to make sure that no matter what distraction our puppy or our dog sees, they've been trained through that thing. Um, Maybe not every single thing, but you get the gist of it. So to proof it in using sit as an example, I might practice having my dog sit and then I might, you know, start jumping up and down or clapping my hands or making some sudden movements. And if my dog goes, that's exciting, they get up, I can say, oops, and I can place them back. And then I might try it again, but I might clap my hands softly or I might just bounce up and down very gradually. And if the puppy goes, okay, I think I can sit during that, yes, I can reward. Um, I might bend down and tie my shoe. I might pull a tennis ball out of my pocket and start bouncing it. And then I, again, I'm not doing these distractions to cause my dog to break. I'm doing them in a way to proof it so that I can get a reward in. So my goal is to do one distraction and then reward my dog. Mm -hmm. And then maybe make it a little harder and then continue to reward my dog. So my dog's seeing all these things happen around them, but they're understanding, okay, if I ignore that, something great's gonna happen. If I ignore that, something great's gonna happen. I might also proof distance. So maybe there's gonna be a time where, for sit, for example, or stay, I might need to ask my dog to stay somewhere and I might need to walk over and, you know, throw their poop in the garbage pan, damp, the pan. Garbage, garbage Dan? I don't know, garbage, garbage Dan. Garbage, Dan. <laughs> garbage can. Uh, Anyway, so I might practice building distance. And again, during this proofing process, my goal is not for my dog to make a lot of errors. I want them to make some errors so I can then say, nope, that's not right, but this is, but it's to reward them. I might proof by having a few distractions, but the goal is not to put them in a scenario where they're going to be overfaced. I need to be putting them in a scenario where I can control their, the rate of their success compared to their rate of failure. And it needs to be 
far more successful than it is failure. And sometimes when we're in real life situations, like being out on the street and random people can yeah. walk up yep. and random animals can run by, totally. I don't have the control of being able to control the success rate and the failure rate. I might end up having way too much failure and now my dog's just not getting good information. So that proofing phase is really important. And now that we're doing the three Ps, we also have the three Ds, which is distance, duration, and distraction. So those three things are things that we will often go through to proof our exercises. And again, we're using sit as an example, but we follow the same formula for all of our exercises to ensure that our dogs are like bulletproof, super confident, yeah. They understand what that, what their expectation of that exercise is. And, and we talked earlier about perishable skills. Well, if you haven't said sit or haven't had some expectation of your dog to uh, move into that sitting position in like three months, you're not practicing. You need to use these skills once in a while. You know, after you've proofed through all the challenges, puts up. <laughs> Dan, Dan said, what did you call me? Because I said something about garbage Dan, garbage Dan, poopy Dan. I don't know. Um, the other the other example I was just thinking of as you're talking about that is the recall. The <laughs> life-saving skill, you know, this is the one that uh, we get phone calls from our students. You know, they've been in like three lessons or four lessons. They call us, they say, my dog ran out the door at, or he's chasing a deer, you know, and we back onto the forest. And I said, come, and he ran back and then sat in front of me. Th this is... This is a powerful skill. It can be a lifesaver for your dog. And the prepare part building motivation, building drive. You've seen us do this in videos before. Proofing is what we do in our classes or in our online training where we set up some challenges along the way. Maybe, you know, your your uh, dog is being recalled off of like a pile of food. Maybe they're being recalled off of, off of some tuna treats. Mm -hmm. But the proofing phase is really where the challenges is, uh, are introduced. But the practice part, Kayla and I will go for walks. Uh, the McCann uh, properties, beautiful 22 acres all, all grass it's beautiful and we'll take our dogs for a walk well randomly on any given day we might call our dogs one of our dogs to come uh, or respond to their name and we'll reward them when they get back to us whether that's food usually because we've done our preparing and we're planning but uh, maybe it's praise whatever but we need to practice these skills you know we've worked through all the challenges of it now it's time to just like Put in the reps. Look, you want it to look good because you need it to work when it's time. The amount of times mm -hmm. that people go through a uh, dog training program and uh, never use half of the skills, quite often. In fact, we were talking earlier about some important skills that you want to work on. Here's a little dog trainer secret. The stay, having a reliable stay can have a massive effect, massive impact on all of your skills for the same reasons that we saw that rule out work because the stay is a tough one. You know, mm -hmm. it's tough for the dog to understand they need to remain in position. No ifs, ands, or buts about yep. it. But the recall is when you want to be practicing. You know, you want to go out to a safe environment in a situation where you know your dog can be successful or is slightly challenged and practice making sure that they understand that when they respond, when they turn on their name like that and they run all the way back to you enthusiastically motivated and excited that they are rewarded Quiet. and that Stop. you recognize that. That's the basis of the McCann method. That's what we're helping you to do mm -hmm. week in, week out. That's the kind of dog training experience we want you to have. Yeah, totally. I want to say a huge thank you to our instructors who are in the chat tonight. I want to thank you. They were busy tonight for joining awesome. us. Remember, uh, you can join us online: Puppy Essentials for Dogs Under Four Months and Life Skills for Dogs Over Four Months. And uh, if you are local to us, our registration day opened yesterday, I think, or maybe two days ago. Yeah. Uh, now's the time if you want to join with all of the teaching, all of the training, all of the things that we've talked about tonight. The rest, my friends, well, that is up to you. We do these live streams to educate you, but more importantly, to motivate you. You can have the dog that you've always wanted, but it's just going to take you a little bit of work. I would know because I was just like you. Long before I became a dog trainer, I was a frustrated dog owner, but the skills that I learned at McCann's changed my life. Now we have hundreds of videos here on our YouTube channel to help you to have a well-behaved four-legged family member. 
But if you want someone to guide you through the dog training process, then you should check out our Puppy Essentials program for puppies under six months. If your dog is over six months, then you could join our Life Skills program and our instructors are gonna help to make sure that everything goes as smoothly as possible in a really supportive environment. All of the knowledge about dog training in the world won't help you to be successful unless you get up and you start training. The real question is, what are you going to train next? Happy training.